Доброго дня всім. Знов в нашому новий підвечері, який тільки що приєдналися до нас. Вже на третю зустріч, яка зараз розпочнеться в рамках 18 International Collectors Forum. І на зв'язку з нами зараз Каролайн Даглс, а також Олі Цінор, наш гість Бертран Кос, колекціонер, що буквально недавно приїхав до нас з Лондона. І тема нашої зустрічі буде придбатна благодійність на службі у публічних колекцій Товариства сучасного мистецтва у Лондоні. І мені б хотілося ще трошечки презентувати наші гостей, колитку, будь ласка. Бартран Кос, золотий меценат, член Ради розвитку Товариства сучасного мистецтва у Лондоні, очільник благодійного фонду «Срич Фондейшн». Бертран фінансує дослідження наукової команди Інституту археології на Україні в галузі влучення енергії Східної Європи, начальник продовжувач традиції Волини Демонів, які були палкими прихильниками та володими сучасного мистецтва. Наскільки ми знаємо, сім'я Демонів була одним із таких ініціаторів, і вони фінансували створення родку в Америці. І зараз на зв'язку з нами Каролайн Даглс, директорка товариства сучасного мистецтва у Гондані, благодійної організації, що купує твори сучасних художників для подальшого розміщення їх у публічних колекціях Сполучного королівства. Каролайн очолювала колекцію Мистецької ради Англії 2006-2013 роках, була порадникою департаменту візуальних мистецтв Британської ради 90-2006 років. Тобто в нас сьогодні такі надзвичайно цікаві гості та спікери. І що ж, по формату ми даємо нашому спікеру можливість презентувати на тему в невелику презентацію, а далі ми переходимо до обговорення Q&A session. Dear Caroline, so I have made an introduction and so it's now time for your talk and for the presentation of Contemporary Art Society in London. So and of course the question how it appeared, what do you do? And so we are looking forward for your information. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you so much for inviting me to um, speak today. Um, I'm going to see if I can share my PowerPoint. Here we go. And okay, can everybody see that? Yeah. Is that good? Okay, fantastic. Um, so, um, I'm very used to speaking to people about the Contemporary Art Society and largely to audiences who have never ever heard of it. Um, so I will um, uh, enjoy explaining a little bit about this very unique organization. It's unique, not just in the UK, but I think also internationally in terms of uh, its history and the way that it functions. Um, I always start by showing this slide because I hope that it helps you to understand um, some of the structure of the way that we work. So the Contemporary Art Society is a charity. Um, we receive just about 10% of our annual funding through the government uh, from the Arts Council, uh, the, through the Arts Council England. The remainder of our funds are uh, privately raised. This slide shows all of the museums in the UK that we support. There are 72 museums all across the UK from the far north of Scotland and the islands all the way down to the south of Cornwall. Um, and they are museum members of the Contemporary Art Society. And if you like, they are the bedrock of what we do. They pay a small subscription every year to be members of the Contemporary Art Society. Currently that's about 1500 pounds. And for that, they're entitled to receive works of art from us. In addition to this, we have um, about 100 individual patrons 
That would be uh, individuals largely based in London, but not exclusively. I would say all of them have at least one home in London. Um, and we have some small corporate, uh, a number of corporate patrons. We run fundraising events all throughout the year. Um, and our expenditure on contemporary art at the moment runs at around half a million pounds a year. We are a, a team of just 16 people uh, who used to work in an office together, but obviously we haven't done that for almost a year and a half. Um, I'm going to explain some of the history of the Contemporary Art Society um, and I'm going to sort of organise it around some of the rather extraordinary individuals who have been really uh, key figures in our history to try to give you a picture of how um, really the society uh, has had a changing cast of characters who are all custodians of an idea. And the idea being that it is vitally important to support contemporary artists, young artists, specifically at the beginning of their careers by buying their work and seeing it go into museums. Right from the very start, we have always um, supported museums in the UK, but been committed to buying internationally. So the Contemporary Art Society was founded on the 18th of May, 1910. It was founded in the home of the Lady Ottoline Morel, who was the wife of a Liberal MP, together with D.S. McColl, who was Keeper of the Tate Gallery, Charles Holmes, who was Director of the National Portrait Gallery, Roger Fry, who was a curator of the Metropolitan Museum in um, New York, and Charles Aitken, who was then the Director of the Whitechapel Art Gallery. All of them, were associated with members of the Bloomsbury Group, who were a group of artists and quite radical thinkers, centering around uh, Roger Fry, Clive Bell, Duncan Grant, and Vanessa Bell, as well as uh, Lytton Strachey and others. And I um, picked this rather wonderful archival image just for its pertinence in the year when a lot of people have been having their haircuts outdoors during lockdown. Lady Ottilie Morell was an utterly extraordinary woman, radical in her ideas and also in the, the way that she led her life. In uh, the year that the Contemporary Art Society was founded, she wrote this in her diary. She said, I feel strongly now that every penny one can save ought to be given to young artists. At least we who really feel the beauty and wonder of art ought to help them. There are heaps of people who understand philanthropy and who can help, but so few can hear the cry of pure art. And young creators have such a terrible struggle. And I think one of the, um, one of the themes that will run through the next few comments that I want to make with you is, uh, is how little has changed over the years and how um, basically the Contemporary Art Society is still doing roughly what we started out doing 110 years ago because the struggle is still enormous for young artists. Lady Ossoline, um ran what would be termed a salon in London. Um, they, she and her husband also had um, a home in Oxfordshire, Garsington Manor, which is now the home of Garsington Opera. Um, she was radical in her intellectual beliefs as well as in her social uh, attitudes. Uh, she and her husband both had uh, many lovers within an open relationship. Um, she is known to have had a long affair with uh, the philosopher Bertrand Russell, with whom she exchanged more than three and a half thousand letters. And her lovers may also have included the painters uh, Augustus John and Henry Lamb, the artist Dora Carrington, and the art historian Roger Fry. This is a photograph of her later in life with Augustus John there on the right and Dorelia McNeil, who was Augustus John's wife. 
Augustus John was the most highly regarded British artist of his day. Um, and the first painting that the Contemporary Art Society ever bought by clubbing together and um, paying one guinea each uh, was this painting called Woman Smiling um, from 1908 or 9. It's in the collection of Tate. Uh, it's almost always on display. Um, it's a painting that Augustus John did of his wife, Dorelia, and it was at the time considered incredibly radical. Um, one of the most difficult things about contemporary artists to, is to try and recover the radicality of older work. Um, but she was considered radical because of her stance, the way that she's looking straight at the viewer. It's almost one-to-one -one scale. You need to understand this is a, a big painting. And there she is with her hands on her thighs, um, with her, her knees apart. It's a very bold, quite uh, immodest, pose for a woman, um, but it was considered uh, the finest painting of that year and was the very first work that the Contemporary Art Society bought. Um, in the early years of our existence, we only ever donated to Tate, but very soon other museums started to petition to uh, benefit from our gifts. Um, and the, the first museums to join after Tate were in Manchester and Belfast and in Leicester. As I said, we always bought internationally right from the start. Roger Fry was um, the person who curated the first ever post-impressionist exhibition in London. And this group of intellectuals and artists who, who were the, the core of the Contemporary Art Society were really the first people in the UK to understand the importance of the, the avant-garde um, at that time in the European mainland. So they were back and forth, um, largely Francophile in their tastes, but in and out of the artist studios, buying work by Gauguin and Bonnard, Picasso, Cezanne, um, buying from the artist studios and donating to museums, largely to Tate at that time, as I say. And this was the beginning of what has become an incredibly long track record of the Contemporary Art Society being the very first to uh, buy works by artists who, who go on to, to make enormous international reputations. Um, there's a party at the Tate in the 1950s. I hope you can see the captions here as well. The next individual I want to point out um, and highlight is this man, Edward Marsh. Um, he was a strange and very, very unique person. He had a career as a civil servant and he worked as the private secretary to a series of Great Britain's most powerful ministers and had a very long association with Winston Churchill. He was a sponsor of poets and a friend to Rupert Brooke and Siegfried Sassoon. But um, one of the most extraordinary things about him is the source of his private fortune. Some of the money Marsh had to spend on art was the remainder of a family legacy from the death of his great grandfather, Spencer Percival in 1812. Spencer Percival was the only British prime minister to have been assassinated. And um, at that time, parliament voted to settle 50,000 pounds on Percival's children. In today's money, that would be about eight million pounds. Um, and there were additional annuities for Percival's widow and eldest son. A hundred years after that, Edward Marsh was still using the money and still using that money to buy contemporary art. Um, he was a trustee of the Tate Gallery from 1937 and um, uh, the chairman of the Contemporary Art Society from 1937 until 1952. 
He, he was renowned for having incredibly broad taste in art, so much so that sometimes people wondered whether he actually had a personal taste at all. But um, he was very, very loyal to Stanley Spencer, uh, the Nash brothers, Duncan Grant, Mark Gertler and their contemporaries. And these were the artists that he collected time and time again. He was also very pioneering in that, um, oops, a daisy. Oh, my PowerPoint seems to have frozen. Here we go, let's try that. There we go. This is one of the works that he um, purchased. Beautiful Mark Gertler. He was a great uh, champion of Henry Moore um, at a time when contemporary sculpture was considered incredibly uh, radical and also hard to collect. This um, fantastic sculpture, which is the earliest sculpture by Henry Moore uh, in the Tate's collection, um, was the subject of uh, petitioning by Edward Marsh to the Tate, pleading with them to accept it at the time. Um, he was also uh, rather remarkable in suggesting the commissioning of contemporary sculpture in the public realm very, very soon after the end of the Second World War, um, at a time of enormous uh, deprivation across the country. Uh, the country was in ruins at that time. Um, and he was the one who proposed this first ever commission, uh, these three standing figures. Um, which he commissioned directly from Henry Moore. Um, and there's a fantastic letter that Henry Moore himself wrote um, at the time accepting the commission, where he explains that it will mean that he has to turn down the, muse um, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, um, whose director, the great Alfred Barr, had been petitioning for a large scale sculpture for their garden. Um, but he felt that, uh, he says, um, I think they will understand me satisfying a home offer first. Um, and he has a wonderful PS to the letter he's writing from his home in Hoglands uh, in Hertfordshire. He said, PS, the three large blocks of stone for the groups arrived today and have taken all day unloading. It's been a most difficult task getting any quarry to provide and deliver the stone. You can imagine the, the boldness and the ambition of doing something like this when the, the country itself was being rebuilt. This is Pauline Vogelpohl. And I confess I am slightly obsessed with this woman. She was completely remarkable and invented many of the fundraising strategies that people still use today. Everything about Pauline Vogelpohl exudes style, said Roy Strong in his diaries. He admired her eye for color and design and mentioned her white drawing room in her Little Bolton's flat in the 1970s with its pretty and unusual objects, many of them discovered in the Portobello Road. Um, Vogelpohl, who died in 2002, age 76, was born in Lorenzo Marquez, which was the capital of what was then the Portuguese colony of Mozambique. Her father, the Dutch consul there, ran a trading and shipping business. After his early death, her French mother moved to South Africa and settled in Cape Town. Pauline was educated at Herschel School and graduated from Cape Town University. After that, she ran a South African Association of the Arts and opened her own pottery studio. In 1950, she moved to London with, as she put it, two pictures, six indigo blue dessert plates, and a trousseau of quite unsuitable clothes. With her looks and her charm and infectious enthusiasm for people and design, she drifted towards what was to be a long career promoting modern British art. In 1954, she joined the Contemporary Art Society, which was then based actually in the basement of the Tate Gallery. In 1956, um, Pauline was made the organizing secretary of the Contemporary Art Society and in 1976, its director. 
She transformed the CAS from being a reputable institution into a noteworthy one, working hard in the little basement office, inevitably accompanied by her pug dog called Lucas. Pauline realized that to keep the CAS's profile high, she should attract corporate supporters and that she should organize treats for them. These included glamorous candlelit dinners in the central Devine Gallery of the Tate Gallery and trips abroad. This is Pauline later on. Oh, oh. Um, where are we? Um, yes, the first trip abroad involved chartering a plane to Amsterdam for the day but soon there was a visit to Washington and to New York where the Museum of Modern Art organized a reception in their honor. And by the mid 1960s, the treats had become trailblazing and exotic forays involving visits to public and private collections in China, Nepal, Russia, Cambodia, Mexico, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and East and West Berlin, always accompanied by dozens of her adoring members. Among Pauline's important ideas for the Contemporary Art Society was distribution exhibitions from which member museums could select works of art. At her first in the 1950s, the curator of the art gallery in the small Yorkshire town of Batley, a pipe smoking Yorkshireman, spotted a Francis Bacon that the Tate didn't want. I like that, he said, and so he got it. Um, that painting is now uh, still in that uh, museum, uh, 70 years later, and uh, is worth something like 27 million pounds. Um, in 1967, um, Pauline was involved in commissioning and presenting to the city of Westminster this uh, important Henry Moore knife edge two piece um, from 1962, which is actually still there. It's one of the best known pieces of public sculpture in London and um, television camera crews uh, have uh, often used it as a shelf for their equipment when interviewing politicians in front of it. Another um, important supporter of the Contemporary Art Society was uh, Belle Gubler, who I, I mention here. Um, she was later uh, Belle Schenkman um, because she was born in Kiev. I thought that might be of interest to you. And obviously um, the members of the Contemporary Art Society have always been quite an international group. This is her here with the choreographer, Sir Frederick Ashton and then later. She was an important donor um, and um, patron of the Contemporary Art Society for many years. Uh, these are just some of the highlights of um, paintings that were donated to um, member museums through Pauline Vogelpohl's time. This is the Bacon uh, that I was just referring to. And um, another, uh, and connected to uh, Francis Bacon in particular, another example I wanted to give you of ways that the CAS has worked with donors. Um, the, uh, in the 1957, we were approached by uh, Robert Sainsbury, um, with the offer of a, essentially a grant of 1,600 pounds to buy paintings on the strict condition that we should only buy paintings by Francis Bacon. Um, uh, Sainsbury was an enormous supporter of, of Bacon and other young artists of his generation and felt that um, one of the most uh, far-sighted things he could do to support this young artist's career was through the Contemporary Art Society to ensure that paintings, important paintings of his, went into public collections in the UK. And with that 1,600 pounds, Contemporary Art Society was able to buy four works by Francis Bacon, uh, which are still in, in the recipient museum collections to this day. 
um, proving one of the truisms about the way that we operate, which is that if one buys early, one is able to afford works by artists who, who subsequently go far beyond the, the reach of public collections. some of the others. This, um, this is possibly the most important early work by the sculptor Anthony Caro. Um, his breakthrough work on returning from the United States and uh, exposure to uh, work by the important abstract expressionists there. And this is a work that um, betrays all of those influences was um, shown in London as part of a group exhibition and bought by the Contemporary Art Society for Tate at that point. Again, the society always tracking these early developments. Here's um, Pauline Vogelpohl with a group of supporters. Um, I find it extraordinary that they were, they were so pioneering and brave in their traveling um, in the mid sixties. There we are, there's another trip to Hong Kong in 1964. Um, one of, uh, I think this is possibly the last person I'm going to pick out and she's Nancy Balfour, um, another extraordinary individual. And I hope you see maybe the, the point I'm trying to make about a sort of baton being passed from one incredibly strong, determined individual to another, leading the organization and attracting people to them. Time and again, across you know, 110 years, there have been these amazing individuals who were very, very passionate about contemporary art, all coming from very different uh, backgrounds, different walks of life. So Nancy Balfour um, never married or had a family. Um, she was born in San Francisco um, but um, soon moved to England. She was educated at Oxford, where she took a degree in philosophy, politics and economics. Um, during the war, she worked in the Foreign Office Research Department and then for the BBC North American Service before being offered a job at The Economist uh, magazine. She retired from from journalism in 1977 and first became the treasurer and then the chairman of the Contemporary Art Society. She had been buying art since just after the war and made a point of supporting living artists and visiting their studios. And when she died, she left her collection to be distributed among museums by the Contemporary Art Society. She... Um, there's a great quote uh, in the book that the Contemporary Art Society published after her death, um, a quote from Nancy. She says, I've never bought anything by a dead artist apart from a few antiquities, nor have I ever bid at auction. She bought works because she loved them, not as an investment. Although the first purchase that she ever made was a maquette by Henry Moore. So she had an amazing I, nonetheless. Um, she, uh, yeah, she was known um, by the nickname Nasha because she was really rather fierce and critical of everybody around her. Um, this uh, Tom Bendham was um, a very notable patron of the Contemporary Art Society uh, in recent years and actually was the person who completely transformed our fortunes at the beginning of uh, the 21st century. Um, because when he died, he not only left us a large number of works of art to distribute to museums, but he left us his studio, he was a painter. And with that, uh, property which we sold, we were we raised funds to be able to buy our own first permanent home. Um, so we now own our own premises, which gives us a sort of financial security, which across 110 years we had never previously had. Um, 
where other organizations might have founded an endowment fund or some other investment vehicle. We didn't do that. We've always fundraised year on year. Um, and uh, Tom Bendham is the person who's rather transformed our fortunes. And this is um, bringing us uh, more or less up to date. Um, I think actually, Bertrand, you are in this shot. Yes. <laughs> um, we are still um, following Pauline Vogel Pohl's model. We, uh, well, up until the pandemic struck, um, we do fantastic international trips with our patrons um, every year. Um, always uh, long haul, um, including visits to private collections, to commercial galleries, to noteworthy museums. Um, it's a great way of bonding with those people who support us, um, all of whom are collectors and people, I suppose, united by a real desire to, to learn more, to see more about contemporary art. Um, we don't have the most enormous group of patrons, but they are incredibly loyal um, and active. Um, and um, I suppose I wanted to sort of finish by... Um, uh, showing you, um, here we go, yes, we do lots of activity in London, um, tours of commercial galleries, uh, studio visits with artists, talks, um, something I would say every two weeks that people can attend. It's a great social um, occasion, um, great friendships are forged through this group, but it's very much a group who are all about the art, who are interested in learning. It's quite serious. Um, this is a work that we bought um, for Leeds Art Gallery, this piece in the centre, um, in 2014. Um, here's another work, major work that was a gift uh, from the artist. I'm just showing you some of the things we've done most recently. This work on the far right of this image is a painting by Glenn Brown, which we commissioned and donated to museum in Newcastle a few years ago. Um, it's uh, the very first work by this internationally acclaimed artist to go into a room in the UK. This um, uh, large neon work here um, with the artist himself is uh, by Kareth Wynn Evans and was the first work of Kareth. He's a, a Welsh artist and we presented this to the National Museum of Wales a few years ago through the same scheme. And these are, these are the largest scale pieces that we've um, donated in recent years. We donate between 40 and 100 works a year. It's a funny thing to count because sometimes you might have 50 tiny things or uh, fewer major pieces. Um, we were delighted to be able to um, donate this uh, beautiful 16 millimeter film by the acclaimed um, film director and artist, Steve McQueen to the art gallery in Wolverhampton recently. These, these last three have, uh, were acquisitions that were funded by a single individual. Um, here's the Olafur Eliasson. Okay, and then I just wanted to finish um, by showing you two works that um, Bertrand will know all about, uh, because these were uh, supported by the Search Foundation that uh, Bertrand is associated with. Um, and they are major, major pieces that we acquired slightly outside of our regular schemes for purchasing, but were extraordinary opportunities which arose. This sometimes happens where um, we become aware of a work that's available briefly and uh, there's, there's great interest in one of our museum members in acquiring it. And then I will make approaches to some of our patrons individually to ask whether they would like to support it. And so um, uh, we were able to purchase this major installation by Prem Sahib, who's a, a Pakistani artist based in London. Um, and um, most recently, this 
um, magisterial, extraordinary film essay by uh, John Acomfra, um, which was um, acquired jointly by the National Museum of Wales and the Towner Art Gallery, which is uh, located on the south coast of England. Um, it's one of his most important works um, of recent years. It was debuted at the Venice Biennale in 2016 and um, is actually on show right now and will be on display for the whole of the summer. Um, and I think I will draw to a close there. Um, I hope I've given you some sense of, of who we are and what we do. But I'm happy to take questions if anybody would like to. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, so I will ask you a question and then translate because we need a microphone as well. So uh, before to give a word to our guest Bertrand Post, uh, who is a golden member of your society, of uh, can you tell in short how many members do you have right now, and what are the procedures of becoming a member, and maybe major responsibilities or obligations of the members of the society? Я швиденько перекладу, що моє питання, як вступити, як стати членом товариства сучасного мистецтва в Лондоні, що вимагають від члена, так? Тобто, які можливі контрибюції має робити учасник цього товариства? Ну, це головне питання. So I think you're asking me about the people that we refer to as patrons. Um, and our, we have about a hundred patrons, a hundred individual patrons, um, and there are different levels of patronage. So we have uh, a young patron group who, um, yes, we don't ask to see people's birth certificates, but it's generally people who are in their thirties, uh, some in their twenties, and they pay a thousand pounds a year for, um, for their patronage. Then we have silver gold a silver and gold level patronages which are variously two and a half thousand pounds a year and five thousand pounds a year and then we have a very special quite small group of individuals who we refer to as the council who pay upwards of ten thousand pounds a year from them for being a, on the council and there are no responsibilities um, the responsibility in a way is in the opposite direction. We feel a responsibility to our patrons um, to keep them close to the organization and to um, help them to enjoy being part of the society uh, and to understand where their money goes and, and the good that it can do. Thank you. Thank you. And now I have a question to our guest, Bertrand Kost, because uh, here we have a possibility to ask actually a member. Uh, why do you think that uh, it's important for you to participate in uh, this society? And um, why? So it's the first question. Shall I translate it? Or you understand? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Caroline, for this brilliant lecture about the Contemporary Art Society. I hope everybody likes it here, at least as much as me. <laughs> so why I am a member of the CAS, the art world has exploded over the last 30, 40 years. I like it. I came from a family with a lot of tradition in it, but there is no way I can have a professional activity and spend the time to run around all the art fairs, maybe 450 before COVID, uh, 1,000 galleries in London, and I'm not speaking about Paris, or Bonn, or Zurich, or New York. So I need to have people like you who can explore, select, explain uh, who are the artists, who are the new trends. You need to speak a little louder because you can Okay. Okay. Louder. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, I need to have the contemporary art society because of the multitude of art fairs in the world and galleries in the major cities. 
explain to me, to your knowledge, to direct me, to teach me about the new artists, the new media, the new trends, which I would have no time to do by myself. And we're doing this very well, and we can emphasize it by special visit to artist studio, artist dinner, when we meet the artists, have the opportunity to buy special work of art, and all for this extremely interesting trip of road <clears throat> when we can discover new connections and new collectors, and what do they like, and what do they do in the trip in Texas, was specific. And of course, uh, I have to work for you because I'm part of the development uh, committee and, uh, and we have to help to, to find new members and new forms. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, thank you, Bertram. And uh, now, question to Caroline. Uh, Caroline, um, so the question is. Uh, what kind of activities you do in order to attract new members? So how do you motivate probably newcomers to participate in uh, grants and gifts to the museums? <clears throat> yes, we're, we're, it's a great question because we are always trying to attract new people. Um, and um, one, of the, one of the key things that we do is um, ask our, uh, one of our existing patrons if they would host an event in their home. People love to go to somebody's home and look at their collection. Um, it makes it, ac it, makes it um, accessible obviously to go and look at, but it opens up the whole kind of methodology of how one collects as a private individual. And people always find that fascinating, you know, how, how does one, you know, how does a private collector put it together? How do they make their decisions? How are they curating? Uh, how are they curating their collection? So we might organize a cocktail or um, a little informal talk in somebody's home. And then we would invite existing patrons to bring along a friend, somebody they think might be interested. Because there is there is a very there are two important aspects to it there's the desire for knowledge but there's also the social aspect and it's very much a group of like-minded people who support the contemporary art society so it it has to feel comfortable and stimulating amusing um generally i think people find lots of connections social connections um and and as i said before you know great friendships are forged in this way and it's that sort of approach where you glue people together, not only by their interest, but socially, that I think gives you the sort of stability of our group. Have you thought of making uh, your own collection, the collection of the society, and to use your premises to exhibit this collection? Um, it, is, it is often pointed out to me by my trustees that had we retained ownership of all the art that we have donated in 110 years, we would be extremely wealthy um, as an organization. Um, however, um, no, we, we give away all the art that we buy. Uh, we donate it title, legal title in all the artworks passes to the museums. Um, and that means that we are very light footed as an organization. We're not weighed down with a big collection that we have to service. We don't have anything to store. We have no conservation bills. We don't have to have a staff to care for it. And no, we don't have a premises to show. It's, um, yeah. You have one now. <laughs> well, <laughs> right now we have a little pop-up uh, commercial space in Mayfair in London, where um, we have work on consignment that we are selling and we are taking a small percentage of the sales to help our acquisition funds. And we're doing that because we were offered the space for free um, by one of our patrons who, who owns it. Um, it's temporarily, it was temporarily empty. So we are in residence 
there just for three months until the end of August. If anyone's in London, please come and see us. We'd love to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and now I have a question to Bertrand. Uh, so for you, uh, participating in uh, the activities of the society, uh, what do you like most of all? To be in the nature, to communicate, uh, new questions, uh, maybe education because you know more artists. What is uh, actually, uh, I mean, uh, what is motivating you to, to participate? Because I, I guess this is not the first year, yeah? You, you come every year. Because mm -hmm. the, the most important one and the most serious one is to learn about what's happening in the world of art. And I have to work harder on it. I'm not learning enough on it. And so I think <laughs> that's my fault. Not yours. And what I like a lot are meeting the other collectors by going to see their old collections, uh, speaking with the artists uh, through the artist dinners or visiting their studios. And I like a lot the uh, trip abroad, and hopefully we will be able to start to get because we really see things I would have never thought it would be possible to. I would have never thought it in Texas or China or Venice or other places. We will see so many interesting things that we will probably not be able to see by myself. Thank you. Uh, Caroline, I have a, a question to you. Um, so when uh, uh, people become a member of the society, uh, this um, money the society got, do you spend them on a gift to the museum or on the organization of the activities of the society? And gifts you raise additionally from the members or patrons. Uh, how do you manage, I mean, the um, so active activities of the society? Uh, because I guess the, this budget is not enough to do what you do. Um. So, well, as I said, you know, there's, we have uh, income from individual patrons, uh, from, the, from their patronage. Um, we have income from some corporate patrons. We also run fundraising events um, throughout the year. And one of the, the key events that we do, we do two events every year, which we call the artist's table. And that's typically a dinner uh, in an artist's studio. Um, and it depends how big the studio is. So we went uh, and had a dinner at Anthony Gormley's uh, studio, the sculptor Anthony Gormley, and we could, his studio is enormous. So we could have a hundred people sit down for a very, very grand dinner. Everybody could um, meet Anthony Gormley, see his work, see, see his intimate working space. Uh, people pay to go to one of those dinners. Um, and, um, at every one, the artist will make a small number of inter small scale works which are sold on the night. So we raise around a hundred thousand pounds at each of these events throughout the year, and all of these all of these strands uh, go together to to fund our core acquisition program. On top of that, we have other schemes that we call special projects that's how we group them um, and those are funded entirely by individuals so for example um, one of our trustees is a collector called Valeria Napoleone she only collects women artists and she funds a scheme with us where we buy work by a woman artist for a museum every year um, she's very involved with it. She, she enjoys the research process with the museum curators. Um, she's very active in New York, so she has great uh, intelligence from New York about upcoming artists. Uh, so that would be separate from all the patrons. She, she funds that award uh, separately. The scheme that we call Great Works, where, where I show the slides of the Kareth Wynne Evans, the Glenn Brown, for example, the Steve McQueen, those are all funded by another trustee um, separately on top of everything else that we do because of a particular passion for 
uh, for the scheme. So, for example, Great Works is designed to, if you like, fill gaps where there are British artists who've made major international reputations in recent years, risen so fast that the museums couldn't follow them financially, just couldn't couldn't keep up. Um, we come in and we make an acquisition by that artist to make sure that they are represented in the appropriate museum. And that is, that's funded separately. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yes, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Bertrand, so now another question to you. Um, uh, me, uh, being a member of uh, the Contemporary Art Society in London, so probably you know a lot of members. Who are they? Are they collectors, artists? Maybe these uh, people are, some of them are curators or directors of the galleries of museums, uh, or just uh, people who have some additional extra money to support culture. The people I know are uh like me, people who are private individuals who are interested in art, mm -hmm. have their own collection, which can be more and speak, and want a certain intimacy that you have with the contemporary society, and which you would not have with a bigger organization like the date. Mm -hmm. So you have more contact with the decision-making process. Uh, you have less people in the group who the visit. That's the main. I don't think we have any curators, so they, they may be conflicted. I don't know. And we don't have artists, that's not really the point. But uh, it is, it's a country of uh, nice people who like art, wants to know more, knows quite a lot, want to specialize, likes the trip, like the opportunity to open their mind. Mm -hmm. That's what I like. And uh, thank you, thank you. One question to you, one question to Caroline. <laughs> so Caroline, one more question. So how do you uh, decide on the gifts? I mean, uh, you must have uh, vast connections with all the museum institutions so to know what to buy and uh, um, who is making a decision about the gift. So um, all of our purchasing is uh, what I would call research-led. So we work in collaboration with the museum curators towards every acquisition, every purchase. Um, museum people in this country are under a lot of pressure of time. Um, you, you will have heard you know, about the decade of austerity in the UK, um, even before the pandemic. Um, it means that the, the museum curators have very little time for research normally. So one of the great advantages of, for them of working with the Contemporary Art Society is that we ring fence time to do research and we support them with um, travel bursaries, uh, we can put together a program of studio visits and visits to commercial galleries while we're doing the research with them. All the museums uh, that we work with will have a collecting policy. They will have a clear strategy for the areas of the collection they want to develop or themes or, you know, the particular subject areas that they're concerned with. Um, and we will help them because we are, we're buying literally all of the time and very, very uh, networked ourselves. We will help them by kind of expanding their knowledge, expanding their understanding of what uh, current practices, introduce them to artists they may not know, um, and work together towards the, the best opportunity that there is at any one time. Obviously, if you're buying, if you're buying in the in the summer or, or in 2021, you may be interested in an artist where there's just simply no appropriate work available. Um, so you just can't, you know, you can't buy that artist at that time for whatever reason. Um, so we, you know, we have to look quite widely sometimes, um, but we know that the museum colleagues really value this supported research process um, where they get to 
be introduced to a, a huge number of artists uh, that they may not know. And the research may lead to many more things than just one purchase. It may lead to invitations for commissions. It may lead to exhibitions, performances, all sorts of other activities spins off from this kind of rich uh, research process. Thank you. And before giving uh, questions to our audience, uh, I would like to ask about the question about the charity, actually, uh, because uh, your uh, activity is a charity. And the question is to you and Birkan. Uh, so if you participate in uh, such kind of societies or donations, what is the legislation in UK? Is there any motivation to people of business to support culture and art? And uh, probably I will ask first Bertrand to answer. Oh, no, no, first Caroline. Yes, and then Bertrand. Thank you. Um, so um, there are some uh, small incentives for UK taxpayers. Um, donations uh, to the society, donations of money to the society by UK taxpayers attract something called gift aid, so that if you are a UK taxpayer and you give me £100 for the society, we can claim 20% on top of that for in gift aid, uh, tax relief from the government, and it counts against your personal tax as well. Um, there are schemes such as uh, acceptance in lieu um, where you can make a gift of art uh, to a public collection and that is uh, again counted against your, your tax bill at the end of the year. But that has to be, that's only eligible um, for works that are considered of national in, uh, importance. So, you know, the Generally, it tends to be uh, older works of art that come into that category, but um, I have, I am actually dealing with one major sculpture, contemporary sculpture going through that scheme at the moment. But we do not have the tax breaks and incentives that they do in the US, for example, which is something we're endlessly petitioning government about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, uh, Bertrand. Yeah, the question to you, do you see for yourself any, uh, let's say, maybe benefits? Uh, so we got the answer about the taxes and, uh, you know, some maybe uh, discounts in payment like 20% and uh, anything. But as um, you are a resident of UK, right, uh, so do you feel that if you participate in charity or in supporting culture, that this is social activity? Position that this is important for you, for your business, uh, maybe for your position, position in society or within your friends and community. I think um, when people just my friends, they think I'm a better man if I participate in the activities. <laughs> <laughs> the tax benefit exists, but they're not huge, uh, but they still exist, but I'm not having for taxes. More because I'm interested in art, and I would probably do it if there was not this tax anyway. Mm -hmm. But we should not say that uh, tax was not. <laughs> of course. Uh, not to change the law, right? <laughs> and uh, some of, how about your friends? Did, have you, uh, did you invite them to the society? And uh, do you think that you can, you know, bias your surroundings for the culture? I do the best I can to bring my friends to society, to ask them to become a silver gold member, to participate in the trips, and to go to the art fairs. And I've been successful a few times. And I hope it will be easier uh, when the pandemic ends, because they like to travel abroad, and they like to go to the art fairs abroad, and have assistance from the cast to participate to the art. At Fair Abroad to the VIP program. Uh, it has been a, a bit slow recently, but I hope it will kickstart again. 
Thank you. Caroline, uh, one more question to you about the international members. So uh, for your society, uh, is it only for the residents of UK or anyone who wish to join the society can join? And do you work only with, you work with different artists and nations, not only uh, UK artists, right? Yeah. Um, no, uh, anybody can can join as a patron. That's there. There are no barriers to that. And we have, a, you know, quite a few patrons who live only a small period of the year in London. And I suppose one of the advantages of membership is that there's um, there's a an existing social circle to move into when you come to London. You know that there'll be activities and you'll meet up with friends that you know and it's very convenient and enjoyable for people um, if they're living, you know, most of the year in the States or, or wherever. Um, so yeah, that works, that works very well for people. So there's no barrier there. And yes, you know, we've always been international in our purchasing. That's something, um, Ooh, particularly with Brexit, that I really, really want to emphasize that we are international in our DNA. Um, and, um, uh, while I suppose it would be true to say that we do purchase probably more UK-based artists than not, um, we, we are buying um, internationally every year, all the time. And um, it's one of the things that our member museums enjoy particularly is that ability to reach outside of the UK and look further uh, and to internationalize their collections. So yeah, it's very, very important to us sort of politically with a small p um, and kind of ethically as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, just um, uh, a question to Bertrand, uh, because you step by step, but you're already integrated into Ukrainian culture life, right? And I you know that you supported uh, several activities, artists, uh, and uh, you have your foundation supporting archaeology. Uh, expeditions through Pila. Uh, it's all your, you know, involvement and support. So, uh, if in the UK uh, you have, uh, you know, community surrounding growing culture of uh, being, a, you know, patron patronage culture. In Ukraine, it's still just the beginning, you know, and we don't have such high level of development of these charity activities and patronage, but still we do that. So tell me uh, more about these activities in Ukraine, what have you supported, and again, why you do it, because you don't uh, acquire any part of your collection, you just support it. I must admit that my own collections of Ukrainian art is negligible because we're only doing gift to special project. So I'm supporting the Tripolian civilization because it's part of the history of Ukraine. Uh, and somebody needs to help your country to find its history. Uh, on a purely artistic basis, there are beautiful ceramics with very contemporary design that so would be interesting to help Ukrainian artists to understand why their ancestors 6,000 years ago have been doing. Uh, for today, I've been mostly involved in projects in Chernobyl, in rules, some public event where I've been helping this project to take place uh, and to exist, but I've never acquired uh, Ukrainian art at this stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, actually, Caroline, we finalizing with my questions. Uh, and uh, I wish that um, 
the society, contemporary art society in London will find time to come to Ukraine. Uh, and uh, actually, the Trump had an idea to make a special event or meeting with Ukrainian club of collectors. And uh, I'm sure we will find also some time possibility for Ukrainian collectors to come and meet you and communicate. That will be a great experience, I guess, on both sides. And now I want to give a possibility for our audience to ask a question. So if you have, please, and I will translate. Ready? Do not be shy. Don't be shy. <laughs> the one half opportunity. Можете просто сказать, я переведу. Давайте лучше микрофон. Да, так. Не слышен вопрос. По поводу женского искусства, упомянула, насколько там серьезное напряжение на гражданской информации. Я даже не знаю, что там есть те заболевания. Caroline, do you have any um, uh, societies supporting uh, um, women artists? So, or do, do you have any special, maybe, projects uh, or activities dedicated to women? Do you mean art? There's a contemporary art society. Right, right. Yes, so we have this, we have this one, well, we are very feminist at the Contemporary Art Society. Um, and we support a lot of women artists through all of our schemes, or every year. Um, it's something that we are very conscious of. Um, so um, we are, we're sort of policing ourselves and making sure that uh, we're representing all the genders correctly. And, and it leads me to something that is very much at the forefront of everybody's mind at the moment, that is the question of representation within museums. Um, and that is representation of all the genders, uh, as well as people of you know, very diverse ethnicities. Um, one of the things that um, museums are very concerned with is that their collections should uh, properly represent the community that they sit within and um, all of the people within that community. It's, it's remarkable how, um, how, well, I mean, it's not remarkable how white uh, the, the museum collections tend to be, white and male. Um, and the gender issue is something that we have addressed um, for, for many years now, um, but that has expanded um, in terms of a, a much more granular understanding of representation. So when we're, when we're working with one of our museums, for example, um, and doing this whole process of research that I was describing, we will ask them, okay, you know, what, what does the population of your town look like? And it may have a very important Caribbean community. It may have a very important Sikh community or Bangladeshi or, you know, um, Polish or, you know, different towns and cities across the country have different profile. And, um, and that's something that we really want to be kind of talking to the museum about and saying, okay, well, how, how does the museum speak to all of the community? Uh, it makes an enormous difference to who walks through the door. You know, if you walk into the museum and you see no, no representation of yourself anywhere, then it's very easy to feel that it's not an institution for you. So, um, so yes, we, we have the one, this one scheme with Valeria Napoleone, which is a separate scheme, which is only buying major works by female artists, but we are buying works by female artists all through the year, um, as well as this, this wider concern with um, the fact that museums should reflect society properly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any questions more? Yeah, please. Uh, Thank you for 
this wonderful talk. It was very interesting, and thank you for the insights into the British contemporary art practice society. And my question was to Bertrand, and um, why did you start uh, collecting or supporting Ukrainian artists and art? Uh, it's a family tradition. I've always seen art around me. My grandmother and my great aunt are major art patrons in France and in America. So uh, I met this artist when I was very young. So I'm just continuing to a large extent the family tradition. The big difference is that I want to connect the art of my generation, even though I'm getting a bit older, and I do not want to connect what they would call the taste of others, what was seen as good art 20, 13, 100 years ago. So it's why I need to join the contemporary art society to help me to see what the new artists, what they may like, because it would be very easy otherwise just to buy old things which have been popular in the past. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for your question. What Caroline, I will translate. A question is addressed to you. So you just mentioned that the society is working with sculptures. So some of the, how do you manage these gifts? I mean, especially the question is about the sculptures in public spaces. Have you done such projects? Um, we have not given a museum uh, a sculpture, I'm sorry, I'm just checking my memory here to make sure I'm not saying, uh, not forgetting something. Um, we haven't given any outdoor sculpture to museums for a while. Um, obviously, it's, you know, it's not a simple thing to, to place a sculpture in the public realm because the responsibility for the maintenance is quite heavy. Um, and I would say actually that uh, you know, collecting sculpture require even you know sculpture to sit in, in a gallery um, requires a really tremendous commitment on the part of the institution. You know, um, museums like to rotate their displays, so inevitably some things will be in storage some of the time, and um, and that's that's a problem. Um, there's also the question of. Um, contemporary sculpture going into collections where there, there is an appropriate context. You can't, you can't easily place a single very contemporary piece into a collection that has no other contemporary sculpture. So, because it sort of kind of makes no sense in a way. Do you understand? Um, where, where we're placed, there are certain museums in the UK that really specialize in sculpture have fantastic collections that in, in a certain way track the evolution of sculpture um, across, you know, decades, sometimes centuries, and where there's a, that's the sort of context I'm talking about. So it is, it's very particular. Uh, and um, there are fewer museums that seriously collect sculpture than collect painting, film, drawing, other, other media. Mm -hmm. I have a question on my own. Uh, when the gift is being done by the society, uh, in the museum, uh, under the piece, when it is signed, um, does the museum say or give the information that this was a gift by contemporary art society? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
that's the credit line is really important for us it's really important um that it's important that the supporters of the contemporary art society the patrons when they walk into a museum they see us referenced you know so they see where their money's going if you like you know it's part of it, it needs to be a, a connecting circle here you know um it's very very important and to me you know i always think it costs nothing to say thank you um and so sometimes the credit line is very is very complicated where there are numerous funders um we you know there are a whole list of works that have the Search Foundation as well as the Contemporary Art Society. So we might say presented by the Contemporary Art Society with support from the Search Foundation and, and for example. Um, yes, and we, we always ask the museums to use that credit line. And in fact, it's part of our contract with the museum. So when we donate a work to a museum, legally, we call it a conditional gift. So the, the title in the work passes from the Contemporary Art Society because we buy the work. We are physically handing over the cash to the artist or their dealer. And then we donate it to the museum. And at that point, there is an agreement and we place conditions on the gift. And the principal condition is that should the museum no longer wish to own the work at some point in the future, they may not sell it they have to return it to us. Mm -hmm. And we can then give it to another museum or uh, do something else with it. But it's, it's designed, this clause is designed to keep important and you know, increasingly expensive works within the public sector. Um, but within that agreement as well is the credit line where we, we ask the, the museum to always uh, describe the way that the work entered the collection. Do they have to display all the time the work of art or can just they put them, they put it in the reserves? Um, we, part of the agreement is that the work donated has to be on display within two years of it being received. Mm -hmm. We cannot oblige them to always show it. It's not really reasonable. Um, and of course, at the moment, when so many of the museums have been closed so much, showing something within two years of the gift is a little, we're being a little bit more flexible about it because it's, you know, everything is, yeah. nothing is normal at the moment. Um, but yeah, that's, so we, we oblige the museums to show within the first two years. And of course, you know, the sign of a really successful gift is that it's on display a lot and that it gets loaned a lot. So that, that big neon piece that I showed you by Kareth Wynne Evans that we donated to Wales has been almost perpetually on loan to other exhibitions around the whole world because it's, it's such an important piece, which is very, it's very pleasing. <laughs> Get it right, you know? Uh. Yeah, Caroline, thank you for a great presentation, for sharing your knowledge and information with us. As you know, uh, and Bertrand was uh, present during the presentation because we have actually a fact that Ukrainian art was donated by Ukrainian collectors to Center Pompidou. And uh, actually there are many questions, how this art will be exhibited, what will be the next projects and the next step with that. We are all discussing that. And uh, I think that your presentation was very useful for all of us to understand how better to work with the gifts, with the patrons, with uh, you know charity, cultural charity, and support. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for your time, and uh, thank you very much, Bertrand, You're welcome. for sharing experience. But you stay with us, of course, Absolutely. right? Okay. So, and I wish you a great Saturday. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you again for your presentation. Yeah. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you. Bye, Bertrand. Thank you. You too.